Yeah, hi, my name is Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey. And uh, I was surprised when I got here, you know, and, uh, and Myers gave me the man-to-man program, you know. And I looked to see when I was speaking because I didn't know which meeting I was going to speak at. And I looked and looked, and I didn't see my name. I thought there's been a terrible mistake. Uh, and then I saw Lamar was supposed to be speaking this morning, so I was thinking of telling his story. <laughs> but then I realized I didn't know it. But I do know mine, so I'll go ahead with that. And, uh, I'll tell you, my sobriety date is November 20th, 1989. And the, the reason for that is largely because November 19th, 1989 was a really shitty day. <laughs> Really bad. Well, uh, yeah, and I know it is confusing, New York Day from California, but when I moved to California, everybody thought I had an accent for some reason, but I don't. I've completely lost it. <laughs> Except for the word coffee. Anyhow, I was born in New York because I wanted to be near my mom. And... Uh, And things went along fine. I had about five years sober when my father left. I was five years old. And my dad apparently was an alcoholic. I never really knew him. He left when I was five, and I never got a telephone call from him or a birthday card or anything my entire life after that. And, uh, you know, there's something unique about the way alcoholics like myself think. At five years old, I somehow got the notion that he left because of something I did. That I somehow wasn't a good enough kid. You know, and I, I took that on. I took that on for myself, and and I felt kind of bad. My mom remarried pretty quick, you know, because she needed someone to torment. <laughs> I mean, all my friends, when they would come to my house, they'd go, do-do-do, do-do-do, you know? It was like the Adams. I used to watch the Adams family and wish I could be in that family. <laughs> My family was more like I Love Lucy on acid or something. <laughs> and uh, anyway, my mom remarried. She remarried this longshoreman, and uh, he's a big old dock worker. And uh, he was an alcoholic. I can say that now. I know everybody says, "Well, it's n not your job to say he's an alcoholic." Well, you weren't there, pal. He was an alcoholic. <laughs> Even he says that. So anyway, uh, he was the nicest guy in the world, you know, when he was sober. But when he was drunk, he was the meanest, most ornery, son of a bitch that you'd ever want to meet. And uh, like I said, I was now maybe six years old or something and when he, he got mad he would hit me like I was a 35 year old you know I mean I would get stitches I would get beat with belts and with the buckle of the belt and everything and go to go to school with big welts all over me and stuff and nobody ever said what happened to you because it was different times then you know and again I thought there was some deficiency in me that was causing this to happen if I would only be a better kid, this wouldn't happen because I couldn't understand how somebody who in the morning would say, hey, come here, I love you, you know, could treat me like that at night. So I thought it must be something I'm doing. So I resigned myself to becoming the best kid that ever lived, you know. I was the smartest kid in my school every year, every single year. But I, I went to Catholic school. I went to Our Lady of Perpetual Guilt in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, I would get a 99.9 .9 average. Those nuns would not give me 100. And uh, my mother used to look at the report card and she'd go, 99.9? .9? If you would have studied this much harder, you could have got 100. And, you know, so even though I was the smartest kid in my school, and even though I was getting a 99.9 .9 average, I felt like a failure. You know, I felt like I was just this short of being good enough. 
And I carried that stuff around, and it was painful. And at that, you know, when my mom and dad, first, my, I call my stepfather my dad because he's the only one I knew. Oh, they got a disco ball up there. What? <laughs> there was a dance. <laughs> you son of a bitches. <laughs> Well, anyway, I digress. <laughs> well, when my mom when my mom remarried, she and my stepfather had two two kids, two brothers, in quick succession, and there was myself and my brother and my two stepbrothers. And when they had these two kids, they moved me and my brother up to the top floor where we lived. We lived up there, a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. Had, we had our own apartment in the house. I'm not kidding. And my two stepbrothers lived downstairs with my parents. Me and my brother came down for meals. And basically, I was raised by a television set, a black and white zenith that I call mom. And everything I knew, I learned from TV. It was kind of like being there, that Peter Sellers movie. This guy just, everything he ever knew about life, he learned from a TV. And I watched Father Knows Best and Ozzie and Harriet and Leave It to Beaver. And I thought everybody's parents were like that except mine. And I thought I got gypped. I thought I got gypped. I was, in, I was Catholic. I was an altar boy. And uh, I used to get up and say Mass at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'd have to get up and walk through the snow up to the church and go say Mass and stuff like that. And as my father's disease progressed, he began to beat me more and more and harder and harder. I mean, uh, it was awful. And I remember I used to pray on my knees. And I'm not kidding either. It might sound amusing. But I would pray on my knees. Dear God, I don't ask you for much but please let my parents die in a fiery car accident. And I didn't want them to die from the impact. I wanted them to burn in the car. And that's kind of a harsh thought for a, a young kid, you know, under 10 years old to be having. But when God didn't deliver, I said, what do I need him for? Here I am trudging through the snow. I ask him for one little favor. And every morning I wake up and they're still here. So I got a resentment against God. I resented my parents for not being Warden June Cleaver. I resented God for not whacking them. You know, I must have thought of John as like uh, thought of God as like some John Gotti figure up in heaven, you know. Whack them, God. You know, I'm from Brooklyn. Whack them. And uh, God was my button man, you know. <laughs> anyway, I kept going to school and kept trying to excel. And I remember I wanted to play piano. I wanted to learn how to play piano when I was a kid. And uh, my father told me, no, nah, you're not going to wind up like Liberace, pal. You're going to play sports, you know. So I wound up playing sports. And I wound up really excelling at sports. Because it didn't matter. There was nobody on that football field that... I was afraid of because I knew, I said, I got to take this guy out so my dad will be proud of me. But, you know, I was always trying to make myself feel better by gaining somebody's approval. And uh, that continued as a pattern throughout my life. And, you know, my life became so painful so early that I, I remember feeling very suicidal by the age of 12 years old. By the age of 12 years old, I, I'd be up on my third floor apartment, you know, and I would lean out the window as far as I could, figuring, well, suicide, I'll burn in hell for all eternity, but if I accidentally fall out, it'll be all right. And uh, so I would play that game, you know, and, and try to get as far out as I could. I didn't know what to do with all the pain I was feeling. You know, uh, every every day in my house was screaming and chaos and fighting and things breaking and my mother throwing knives at my father. She was like Jim Bowie. You know, she was pretty good with them knives. She'd stick one in his leg, you know. And when you're growing up watching that stuff, it makes you feel like 
perhaps you don't have the most stable home life. <laughs> At least I did. And uh, I wanted to die. I wanted to die, but then... At the age of 12, the summer between uh, my, my graduating from the eighth grade and my going into my freshman year of high school, the most amazing thing happened. I fell in love for the first time with my first drug of choice. Her name was Diane Pahevitz. And I call her my first drug of choice because she did for me what alcohol later did. She made me feel tall and handsome, urbane and sophisticated and witty. She made me feel necessary. She made me feel like I was somebody. And we had this little puppy love thing all summer and it was beautiful. And then one day I went to call for her and somebody I didn't know answered the door and I said, is Diane there? He said, oh, her family moved yesterday. They did so without my approval, I might add. But I was just crushed. I was just crushed because here's this wonderful thing and now that's taken away from me and uh and my friends because i was only about three foot one until my senior year in high school or so you know that i shot up to my present gargantuan stature <laughs> but uh the way i got over with my friends and found acceptance was i was the funny guy you know i made everybody laugh everybody laughed but that, that night when I found out Diane had moved, I couldn't make anybody laugh because I was just all clenched up inside and just doing the best I could not to cry in front of my friends because you don't cry in Brooklyn. You don't cry. That was beat into me. I learned that from my dad when he was whipping me with that belt saying, I will never let you see me cry. I'd cry later when he was gone. But, uh... My friends noticed something was wrong. And my friend Johnny said to me, he says, you know, what happened? I told him, Diane moved, you know. And he said, oh, his heart's been broken. You're a man now. You know, a big 12-year-old man, you know. And so he bought me a pack of Marlboro cigarettes and a quart of Schaefer beer. And I don't know if you ever heard of Schaefer beer. They had it back east. But they used to have the commercial say, Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. <laughs> and it was like a prophecy. <laughs> because indeed, I was having more than one. In fact, I had more than one that night. My friends gave me that quart and I drank that quart down and the most amazing thing happened. Magic happened. It was like when, when the teacher would write on the blackboard and then pick up that eraser and just erase it, it was like somebody erased my pain. I drank that beer down. I didn't remember a hell of a lot, but I remembered that, that it erased my pain. And I thought, wow, this is what I've been looking for my entire life because I don't have to feel that way. All I got to do is pour this stuff down my throat and I don't have to feel that way? Oh, magic, man. Magic. But unfortunately, I couldn't do it all the time because I was only 12 and had no job. <laughs> A situation which was going to extend for many years throughout my drinking. <laughs> but what I did know how to do is steal out of my mother's pocketbook. I had never done that before. But her pocketbook was open and, and I saw that purse and I clipped a couple bucks out of it, and I didn't know it at the time, but what I was doing was the first successful crossing of one of my moral boundaries. I had learned early on, you don't steal, it's wrong. But when it came down to wanting to get some beer, you know, I, I think I got this little guy that lives on this shoulder <laughs> that tells me to do bad stuff. And something on this shoulder that says, don't do that, you know. Well, this guy just punched in the face, you know, and listened to only the other guy for a while. He said, take that money out of your mama's purse and go get some beer. So I did. And I began to, I began to transgress every moral boundary that I set for myself, little by little. Now, I always felt different than everybody. I always felt... 
like a tourist in my own life or something. And when I graduated from grammar school, I, I was so smart that they gave me a scholarship to any high school that I made. So I wanted to go to this technical school and learn, learn a trade. And my parents said, no, we want, it, we want you to go to Catholic high school. So I said, okay, sure, screw me up a little more. So they sent me to an all-male high school. And let me tell you, if you didn't go to an all-male high school, uh, you really don't know what you're missing. You know, uh, It wasn't all about fellowship for me. I wanted... Well, first of all, they sent me to this high school in Bedford-Stuyvesant, section of Brooklyn. It was... Uh, it was mostly all black high school. I was one of about 30 white guys in the school. And I felt different as it was. And now here I am. I'm three foot one. I can't play basketball. I can't dance. I just did the white man's overbite dance. <laughs> you know that one. You guys do it too. <laughs> you know. And... uh I saw Hank doing it at the dance last night. <laughs> That's how I know. And, uh, no, I just felt so different. I felt so different. And one day I was going to school, and this one guy, Hoffy, uh, says to me, he says, look, I got a pint of old Mr. Boston lemon-flavored gin. You want to help me drink this before school? And this was a delightful brew. <laughs> It was gin that had these lemon peels floating in it, in the bottle, that had been there from time immemorial. And I said, sure. So we drank it. Pain went away. Went to school. Don't remember it. But I remember all I could do that day was look at the clock, waiting for 3 o'clock. Because I said, you know what? When I get out of school today, I'm going to go get another bottle of that old Mr. Boston lemon-flavored gin. That's all right, you know? And so I went to school and, and got out of school and went and drank. And there was another one. I'm only going to do it on weekends. Now suddenly I'm doing it on Monday afternoon. <clears throat> so I figured as long as I did it on Monday afternoon already, might as well do it on Tuesday afternoon. Now, I, I didn't know this was called the progression of the disease. I didn't know it was a disease. I thought it was a cure. I thought it was a cure for feeling awful, for feeling empty, for feeling hurt. It was my solution, not my problem. And uh, I continued drinking, and the most incredible thing happened. My grades began to slide. Hard to believe. But it happened. And my parents, as my grades began to slide, because they used to live vicariously through my accomplishments, became ever more aggressive. And at the age of 15, I wound up moving out of my house. And uh, I got an apartment over Jean's Bar in Brooklyn, right upstairs from Flossie and Hungry Jack and their baby that looked like a monkey. <laughs> and this was this house. <laughs> that baby did, too. We used to throw bananas in the carriage, and she would go nuts. And they hated me because, like, my house became party central. You know, I paid $70 a month rent. I was still going to high school, but I had a job after high school. My parents had called the cops and said I was a runaway. So whenever the cops saw me, they would bring me home, and then they would leave, and I'd go back to my house until the cops finally told my parents, look, he didn't quit school. He's working. He's got his own apartment. Leave him alone. We're not going to bring him home anymore. So there I was, suddenly, with nobody to bust my chops about drinking. So I drank. You know, at this time by this time I had a job. You know, so I drank, and it was it was insane. This house. I remember I used to come to in my bed, and I remember one morning I opened my eyes, and some guy is having sex with a girl right next to me in my own bed. And I said, who are you? He goes, I'm Sinbad. And she goes, and I'm his chick. And I said, well, I guess that part, you know. 
But that was the kind of insanity in this house. I remember all my friends, whenever they would come over my house, if they saw an old mattress in the street, they would drag it through the hallway into my backyard till we had this huge pile of mattresses. And we used to jump out the third floor window onto this pile of mattresses. We would get girls high, you know. And then we'd say, I can't take it anymore and jump out the window just to hear them scream. Good American fun, you know. But, you know, I have to say, in the beginning, in the beginning, it was fun. It was so much fun. If it wasn't, I wouldn't have done it. I had so much fun and such a feeling of liberation from these horrible feelings I had I had been the container for my entire life. And uh, I didn't know that alcoholism was sneaking up on me. And alcoholism comes in three phases. This is my opinion. Because ne I've never seen it in the book, but I think it goes fun, then fun with problems, and then problems. <laughs> and when, when it's fun, it's fun. But once it becomes fun with problems, it's never just fun. And once it becomes problems, it's never fun at all. And so it became fun with problems after a while. You know, I remember I used to see my friends getting busted. I'd go, why can't you just be cool like me, you know? Then it was me getting busted. I was reaching fun with problems. I, I, I was going through this weird stuff all of a sudden, you know, like blackouts and everything. You go to brush something off your shoulder and it's the floor. <laughs> that ever happened to you? Raise them up. Yeah. The rest of you are a bunch of liars. And I'd be lurching about the street using parking meters for walking sticks trying to get home. And uh, it was becoming a problem. I was losing jobs because my bosses didn't understand me. You know, they didn't understand somebody coming to work at 7 o'clock in the morning smelling like wine. And Kip was talking about Mad Dog 2020, and I used to drink that too, but I used to drink its grandfather too, which was Gallo Gypsy Rose. It had a picture of a flamenco dancer on the, on the label. And when you drank it, you walked like a flamenco dancer too. Yeah, like... <laughs> I remember when I, when I got here Thursday night, there was this one lurid image that Mac was talking about. Oh no, it was the next morning at breakfast when he was talking about when people would be all geetered up and, and you would, you would climb over a toothpick like it was a telephone pole, you know? And that's how I would walk down the street when I was drinking. But of course, my brain told me, I don't look like that. My brain said, you are urbane, sophisticated, witty, and in control at all times, and six foot five, and bulletproof. And so I went through life in this fantasy world, and all of a sudden it became problems. Problems. All of a sudden, I couldn't keep a job. The only way I was able to keep a job was to start a business and not fire myself. <laughs> and I thought about firing myself. It's just if I figured if I fired myself, who will I get to replace me? <laughs> and my story led me, you know, I go, I attend another fellowship as well because uh, drugs are part of my story. You know, when I drank alcohol, Everything seemed like a good idea. I remember 15 years old, uh, we were stealing stereos from this warehouse in Brooklyn, and we're on the roof with all these stereos, and the cops came for some reason. And I shot at the cop. And he shot back. I was very surprised at this. I mean, I really was. I was behind this chimney yelling at him, What the hell are you doing, man? <laughs> and then I shot at him again. And he shot back a whole bunch of times. 
Well, we got away because we were on the rooftops. We were hard to catch when we were on the rooftops, but that was the insanity, you know. So here, your brain says, shoot at him. It's, he'll be okay with that. <laughs> and I'm just grateful that I didn't hit him or kill him because I might have hit problems a lot sooner <laughs> instead of fun with problems. And anyway, you know, that was the kind of insane thinking that we had. I remember down by the river, these people would say, this is the East River in New York, too. I mean, you know, if you jump in the water, you stay on top. <laughs> unless you break through the film, you know. And these people would say, go on, hey, jump in that oil slick. Well, give me a dollar, you know. <laughs> give me a beer and I'll do it. Anything seems like a good idea when I'm drunk. I remember in, I was in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, visiting my friend Flip, who was a cook at the Brown Derby restaurant there, and he told me, come down to my restaurant tonight, I'm going to make you a fabulous steak dinner. So I said, okay, you know, but I didn't want to embarrass him by drinking a lot at his restaurant. So I stopped off at this joint in Columbus called the Three Little Pigs, and I walked in, I figured I'll have a couple, like a gentleman, and then I'll go eat dinner. So I had a couple of shots, and the next thing I opened my eyes, and I'm looking up at this velvet picture of Elvis on the wall, and the sun is coming through the Venetian blinds like laser beams, and I didn't know where I was. So I opened up the door of my motel room, and there was my car, and I'm looking around, some guy was walking by in a cowboy hat, and I said, excuse me, do you know where I am? And he said, boy, you don't even know where you are. He said, you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, God's country. I had driven a thousand miles. I assume I had driven. I wasn't with nobody. <laughs> and was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I looked in my pocket and I had seven dollars. And I said, I hope I got my guitar in the trunk, which I did. So I wound up going to a bar that night and asking could I play for tips and I'd make about forty-five dollars, fifty dollars and I'd fill up my gas tank and then go back to the bar and drink the rest of it up and go to the next big town and play that way and eventually wound up in California, which was the wrong way. <laughs> I was supposed to be going back east, but I don't know. And I didn't see Flip, my friend the cook, for 19 years. <laughs> True story. I ran into him in New York like 19 years later. I'm sober now, about six months. And he comes up out of the subway station. He just stopped. He goes, where the hell you been? Your steak's getting cold. <laughs> I told him things happened. You know? And they had. <laughs> I know, it even makes me laugh. And anyhow... You know, what happened after a while was I settled down into a pattern of going down the park. There was a park at the end of my block in Brooklyn. And all my friends were there, and we would start drinking at about 7 o'clock in the morning. And then I would pass out about 12 to 1, and then sleep for a few hours and get up and get drunk again and pass out. Couldn't hold a job no more. I mean, even the job, even the job when, when I had my own business, I put myself on probation. But I was still doing bad. I had a business with my sister, and I was robbing 5,000 out of it here and 1,200 there and just doing insane stuff. I remember getting drunk and a friend of mine saying, do you want to smoke some crack? And I said, okay. I said, but we can't do it here. So we went into church and did it in church. <laughs> he, I'm saying, yeah, because I saw Hunchback of Notre Dame. If the cops come, you just say, sanctuary. But meanwhile, I'm in this church and I'm doing this and I'm going, oh God, I know this is so very wrong, you know. But I couldn't stop and I, and I was drunk. And you know, I didn't want to stop at first. Then things got bad. I started like not to have a place to live anymore. Landlords were kicking me out in the street and word was getting around. So other landlords were going, no, we don't want to rent to you. I'm going, wow, this is bad. Then I started having no money. Then I started having to get humble and ask people for money. 
and steal money and manipulate and try to clean myself up for a while just so I could get a girlfriend to take hostage. And then that became my thing. You know, I wasn't in any relationships. I was in hostage situations. You know, these women, they, they wanted to help me and they wanted to believe in me and love me. But I felt nothing. When I was back in New York a while back, last September, I found a letter in my basement from this woman who was in love with me at one time. And she was writing, in the six months we've been together, I can see that there's this beauty inside of you, that there's this wonderful, giving, caring person inside of you that you're killing with alcohol. And I just want you to know I love you and I care about you and anything I can do to help you, I'm willing to stand behind you. So please let me help you. And then she signed her name and when I read this letter I realized I didn't even know who this woman was. She devoted six months at least of her life according to the letter to loving me and caring about me and wanting to help me and I didn't even remember her. And that's a damn shame. You know, alcohol stole large chunks of my life. But anyway, I had lost yet another apartment. I had stolen yet another chunk of money from the business. And now I couldn't even face my sister anymore. Thank you, John. I couldn't even face my sister anymore, so I stopped going to work. And I started living in this cardboard box up on a rooftop. And it was winter time in New York. And I didn't have no blanket, but I thought I was better than some of the other guys because my cardboard box was waxed. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I looked down on them. Man, when it rains, you're in deep trouble, man, you know? <laughs> Mine's waxed. <laughs> and uh, as winter came in, there was going to be a big blizzard in 1989. And it was on the radio and everything. And I knew I was going to die in that box. I knew it. I had alienated my girlfriends, my family, all my other friends. My friends used to use me as the barometer for how well they were doing. Because if they were screwing up, they could always go, I'm not Dave. That's a positive, you know. And so I was in this cardboard box one night and I was freezing, my teeth were chattering, so I went down to the bar, and my friend Henry told me, he says, where are you living, man? Where are you really living? So I finally told somebody I was in that cardboard box, and this guy was a heroin addict, you know, but he, but he lived in his mom's basement, like heroin addicts do, and many alcoholics, too. Lived in his mom's basement, and he told me, you can come stay down the basement till after the blizzard. So I went down there, and I had been down this basement for three days. But I couldn't leave the basement. There was no bathroom there. There was a bathroom in the restaurant on the corner, but I couldn't leave. Because I was afraid somebody might come down with a jug, and I might miss something. You know, my brain was very highly attuned to impending parties. And so I was down this basement, and I had to crap something awful. When all of a sudden, one evening, the door got kicked in, and this fellow came in with a big butcher knife trying to stab me to death. He and I had unresolved issues. <laughs> I know now. <laughs> but I believe there was a high power with me that evening, because this guy made a mighty effort at trying to stab me, and I had a coffee table between me and him, but he destroyed this guy's whole basement while trying to kill me, Unfortunately, I can tell you all, you cannot defend your life from a knife-wielding maniac and control that sphincter muscle at the same time. <laughs> so I had this three-day fecal eruption in my trousers, and this guy is trying to stab me, and finally he said to me, man, I'll kill you later, and he left. And you know, it wasn't until I had about eight years sober. I, I swear to God, I always thought this guy just was tired. And that's why he left. 
when I had like eight years, somebody said, no, I think it might have been the smell of that three-day shit in your pants. So, I know how many of you can say you've had your life saved by crap, but I can say that and mean it. So anyway, this guy said he'll kill me later, and he left. Now, I had been suicidal sitting in my cardboard box for a couple of weeks already. And I was already down in this guy's basement for three days, looking at the basement pipes, wondering which ones would support my weight when I hung myself. You know, and now a guy has tried to stab me to death, and I've shit all over myself. And my self-esteem was at a low. <laughs> I'm glad you find it funny. <laughs> but anyway, Henry looked around at the carnage that this guy had wreaked in his basement, and he told me, man, you got to leave. You draw a bad crowd. <laughs> so he let me clean myself up, and he gave me a pair of jeans of his and threw me out into a blizzard in a pair of borrowed jeans, some socks that had become skin grafts. I had worn them so long. A pair of sneakers and a short sleeve shirt because earlier that day I had bargained away my last negotiable, negotiable possession which was my leather coat for some money for jugs. And I'm in this short sleeve shirt in a blizzard. I'm telling Henry, don't you have a coat? He says, I only have my coat. <laughs> He said, run, man, run to a church or something. So I, I couldn't run. I was just walking, and I put my hands in my po in the pants pockets because it was cold, and there was a quarter in there. How Henry missed that quarter, I'll never know. But I found this quarter, and I went to a phone booth, and I stood there in the freezing cold with the snow coming down, desperately trying to think of someone to call. And I couldn't think of anyone. I could not think of anyone that I could be 100% sure would not just go, you, you bastard, and just hang up. And I didn't want to be found dead without even a quarter in my pocket, because I had my pride. <laughs> you know? So I put it back in my pocket, and I decided I was going to go jump in front of the next subway train to pull in. And the phone booth I was at, it was three blocks in a straight direction, three straight blocks to the train station. So I started walking, and a calmness came over me, a calmness and acceptance of what was about to happen. And I didn't care anymore. I don't want to be alive anymore. I don't want to hurt anymore, and I didn't want to hurt anybody else anymore. And so I started to walk, and I walked two blocks, and then I remembered that guy saying, I'll kill you later. So I said, I'd better cut over a block, get off the main drag, you know? Because you don't want to get stabbed to death on the way to jump in front of a train. <laughs> it would have ruined my whole plan. So anyway, I cut over a block off the main drag, and as I was walking down the last block of my life, all the street lights went out. And I was plunged into darkness, and I'm looking up in the falling snow, and I'm thinking now, when those lights went out, I was thinking of the finality of what I was about to do. Lights out, Dave. And suddenly, I got this cold, empty feeling throughout my body. And I didn't know where to turn, and I didn't know what to do. I had tried everything I knew how to do, and I looked up in the falling snow in the dark, and I said, God, if you're out there anywhere, and you care about me at all, and you have a better idea than my jumping in front of this train, I am sincerely listening. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. So I took like two more steps in the snow, and as I was walking past this church hall, the door opened, and the light from inside fell right on me in this square of light in the dark street. And I was like, oh, it startled me. And this little baldy head popped out, and the guy started going, How you got no coat on, cuz? I said, well, I was painfully aware of this. I was turning blue. My teeth were chattering. And the guy said, come here, come here. Come inside, please come inside. And I was going, who are you? Doesn't matter, come inside, please, because I'll give you a hot cup of coffee and a donut. Come in here with me. 
So I thought a hot cup of coffee to warm up before I go kill myself would be nice. <laughs> and I mean, I really thought that. And so the guy lured me in, just like a dog that's been whipped, where it's scared to come in, but, it, but it's scared to not come in. And somehow, through the grace of God, he got my ass through that door, and the guy walked me down the steps and opened this door, and I walked into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was thought, uh-oh. <laughs> And I didn't know what to think. Here were all these people, and their hair was combed. My hair was greasy as a pork chop, you know. And I was filthy, and they were all clean. And my clothes were basically turning into rags. And I was blue, and my teeth were chattering. And this woman is in this beautiful gown. It was her 10th birthday that night. Her name was Barbara. She was in this beautiful gown all the way at the other end of the room, room about this size. And her friends were all around her giving her flowers and birthday cards and little balloons and shit like that. And she was in this beautiful gown because her husband Mike was going to take her out to dinner and a Broadway show after the meeting. And she said, thank you, thank you, taking her flowers. And she looked across the room and saw me there. And this woman pushed her friends out of the way and ran across this room, ran across the room in high heels and a gown to me. And she put her arms around me. She said, honey, I'm glad you're here. You don't have to die. And I thought, how did she know? <laughs> how did she know? Because I didn't know at the time nobody but another alcoholic has the eyes that can see that kind of misery and hopelessness and degradation and loneliness that they can spot it across a crowded room somebody who has no hope and they can say I got to give him some right now I can't wait because I wanted to run and this lady sat me down in the chair and she sent people to get me coffee and had donuts at the meeting I think I ate every freaking donut <laughs> at the whole meeting I hadn't eaten in days and I was sitting there and this woman's got her arms around me sitting next to me and as I started to thaw out you could smell my ass all the way through the room <laughs> and I was so ashamed I was so ashamed I looked at this woman and I started to cry and she said what's wrong honey I said I'm I'm going to ruin your gown, Barbara. And she said, Honey, I don't give a shit about my gown. I give a shit about you. And when I think of that to this day, I get emotional because I think what a wonderful introduction to this fellowship. For somebody who's about to jump in front of a train because he knows there's nobody who cares about him alive on the planet anymore. That one person thought enough of me to sit down and put her arms around me and let me stink up her gown. Somebody had their priorities straight. And people came up to me and they said, man, you know, you look like you're a really sick guy. And I just was crying. I said, I am. And they said, you better get a sponsor tonight. So I asked them what one was and they told me and I looked around the room for the meanest looking guy because I wanted somebody who was going to beat my ass if I didn't listen. <laughs> and I asked him, will you be my sponsor? And he said, if you stay sober for one day and meet me at the meeting tomorrow night, I'll be your sponsor. So his name was Jimmy G. And I stayed sober. What happened was at the end of the meeting, I thought, well, now all these nice people are going to go home. My brain was telling me, nice try. Now they're all going to go home, though, and the trains are running all night. So at the end of the meeting, we said the Lord's Prayer, and I tried to sneak out, and people started going, Where are you going? I said, I don't know. They said, That's our point. <laughs> so this lady, Pat, she told me, I'll take you to my dad's house and just follow directions. So she took me to her dad's house, and she said, Dad, I got one for you. And her husband, her father Jack, had 17 years at the time. 
And he told me, he says, take a shower because you stink. I'll wash your clothes. He says, go sleep in that bed. And if I hear your feet on my floor in the middle of the night, I'll break your fucking legs, he said. <laughs> That's what he told me. <laughs> so I did. I showered and he washed my clothes and I slept in a bed for the first time in a long time. And I woke up in the morning and he made me breakfast and I felt nearly human. And he told me, he said, son, I can get you in detox today. He says, I am plugged in to every detox in New York City. No problem. I said, I don't want to go to detox. He says, I can get you in a program then, a living program. I said, don't want one. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I just want to go back and see those people I, was, I met last night. He said, all right. So he gave me a coat and he made it clear it was a loner. <laughs> and uh, I walked the streets all day long, up and down the streets in the snow, up and down, up and down, till 7 o'clock that night. And then I went to that meeting and Jimmy asked me, did you stay sober? I said, I did, man. He said, all right, I'm your sponsor. And he says, I got a present for you. I said, what is it? You know, I was, wow, a present for me. He goes, every night you're going to come here at 6 o'clock and you're going to make seven pots of coffee and you're going to put out 13 tables and 100 chairs and you're going to put out the ashtrays and the coffee cups and then at the end of the meeting, you're going to clean all the coffee cups and put away the tables and you're going to wash out the ashtrays and you're going to mop the floors. I said, well, but what's the present? <laughs> And he said, that is the present. And it was the present. Because I did that every night. Every night, every night, every night. And, you know, I felt like I was part of that group. When people were drinking that coffee, they'd be going, I'll wash that cup. Yep. <laughs> Go on, put that cigarette out in that ashtray. See if I give a damn. I'll just wash it up again, you know. I felt like I was needed. I felt like I was part of it. I was the first one at the meeting every night. So I got to meet people when they came in. In fact, you know what was happening one night is I had everything set up and I just hung up the steps and I grabbed the shade and I stepped up on the chair to hang up the traditions and this guy said, hey, is this AA? And I turned around and it was the guy who tried to stab me to death that last night. <laughs> And I looked at the traditions and it said principles before personality. <laughs> so I said, welcome. He said, welcome, my ass, it's you. He said, I'm still going to kill you someday. I said, well, the meeting starts in an hour if you want to come back. So he did come back, but I got a little nervous. So my sponsor got there that night and Jimmy said, you don't look right. What is it? So I told him, well, the guy who tried to stab me to death that last night, He's here at the meeting tonight. And uh, I said, he said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, I figured after the meeting, I'd get a gun and lay from by his doorway and shoot him because I didn't get sober to watch my back. I want to work a spiritual program here, you know? <laughs> and my sponsor, Jimmy, who, who actually had shot probably about 12 people himself while he was out there and just straight up took their stuff and was now a very spiritual man and at peace with himself he said to me I'll come with you and I thought oh this guy's going to shit before I kill him you see Jimmy G there with me so we went back to my house after the meeting he said how many guns you got I said three he said let's get them all I said don't you think that's overkill Jim he said no get them all so I got the three guns he said Let's bring all the bullets. <laughs> so I got all the bullets in the back. Because I can take a suggestion. I'm in recovery. You know? And we walked out of my house and where I was staying. And he says, let's go down here. Let's go down here. Uh, I said, Jimmy, it's the other way. He said, let's go down here. So we walked down to the East River. He said, you think I'm a good sponsor? I said, you're the best. He says, you like being clean and sober? I said, I do. He said, throw your shit in the river. So I did. But then I felt extremely vulnerable. 
So I said, what do I do now? He said, now you pray for the guy. I said, what? Pray for him? He said, yeah, pray for him every single night. I said, pray for what? He said, pray for this guy to have all the happiness, joy, love and acceptance and sobriety that you want for yourself. I said, okay. So I started to pray for this guy. And you know what? I felt a little better. And this guy sat behind me. He used to sit right behind me every meeting to intimidate me or something. But I swear to God, I never thought about him again. He was just another member of AA as far as I was concerned. Jimmy told me when I threw those guns in the river, you don't need any guns. God's got your back now. So I took that suggestion. And uh, he started making me work the steps. I say making me because they say it's a program of suggestions, but for me, he had to make me work them. You know, I, I said, I don't know if I'm really powerless. He says, well, you know what? Act as if you're powerless. He said, remember the last drink you had? What happened? I said, a guy tried to kill me and I shit in my pants. <laughs> I said, so just act as if that's powerless. <laughs> And so I did. I, I worked the first step. And then, and then it was time for the second step, you know. And he was saying to me, he says, well, you know, do you think you're insane? I said, well, I used to be. <laughs> so he was telling me, well, didn't you just want to shoot somebody in the head about like four days ago? You know? I said, well, yeah, I did. And I could, it was like a light going on. I could see that that was insane thinking that I was going to shoot somebody in the head so it could enhance my spiritual growth. <laughs> but that's how I thought. And he was moving me through the steps rapidly too, I mean, because I needed to. I needed to go through them. And the third step, you know, of work turning my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him, I, I didn't understand him. The only thing I knew about God was was that when I said help me that night, that just like that two steps later, I had help. I had all the help I needed to not die that night. And that's all I knew about God. And I struggled with the higher power thing for years in recovery until one night I was watching Nickelodeon and My Three Sons was on. Remember that show with Fred McMurray? So Chip and Ernie, his kids, they got in all this trouble, and they ran, and they said, Bob, we did this and that, we're in all this trouble. And Fred McMurray folded up his paper, and he said, Okay, boys, how can I help? <laughs> and I said, That's my higher power. <laughs> and I, then I struggled with that, because I was raised Catholic, you know, and I thought, I can't have Fred McMurray for my higher power. <laughs> that would be sacrilegious, blasphemy, you know? And the next day, I walk into this record store to buy a record, but they didn't have it. And as I was walking out, I walked past this postcard rack, and right in front of my eyes was a postcard with the cast of my three sons. I swear to God, I have it home in a frame. And to me, that was my higher power telling me, if you need me to be Fred McMurray for you to understand me, then I can be anything. I am all powerful. I can be anything you want. And it, it's just my opinion, but that is my opinion, that God knows alcoholics are such knuckleheads that <laughs> he gave us a wonderful gift. He said, create me. Create me as the being that can help you. Create me as something you can trust to love you. Understand me any way you like. And there are people that will agree with that and disagree with that. That's okay. All I know is, that's in my heart. I had never seen a postcard of the cast of my three sons my entire life until that morning. So to me, I don't believe in coincidence. So I think God gave me that gift. And then I hit the fourth step. I didn't want to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself. Did any of you? But my sponsor told me, man, that's how you... That's how you put all your garbage in the bag. You know, that's how you find out what it is you want to throw out and what it is you want to keep. That's what an inventory is. 
And he made it clear to me that it's not just about looking at your faults. In fact, he told me, I guarantee when you're done, you'll find your assets outweigh your faults. And I didn't believe that at the time. But it turned out he was right. Because all my faults can really <laughs> boil down to just a couple things, you know. Self-centeredness and fear. They're all subcategories of those two things. But I had a lot of assets. And I didn't know I did until I got sober. I found out that I could help people just because they said, Hey, you got a minute to talk, man? I'm going through some crap. And I'd say, Yeah, I got a minute. I got an hour. You know, because I wanted to be there for them the way people were there for me that first night. And I still want that. And we followed the fourth step with a prompt fifth step. You know, and I thought he was going to hate my guts or something or think I was really damaged. But instead he shared some of his, uh, his own stuff with me. And I felt okay. I felt like, you know, I'm just an alcoholic. Because I think part of self-centeredness is not just thinking you're the best person in the world. Thinking I was the worst person in the world is just as egotistical. To think I'm worse than everybody else. So I had to get humble. You know, and humility is like a, a correct understanding of your own self-worth. And I never had that. Because I let everybody else dictate my self-worth to me. I was only worth what you thought I was worth. But in AA, I began to develop a, an opinion of myself through the steps. And, you know, I did begin to become willing to become entirely ready to have God remove my defects of character. And that's a process I'm still in. I'll probably be in it for my whole life. But the willingness doesn't change. You know? Not for long, anyway. I have little patches where I want to hold on to a particular character defect. And then I did humbly ask him on my knees, like it said in there, take away anything that I don't need. Take away anything that's standing in the way, standing between me and you, standing between me and my ability to do service for you. And then I started making my list as if there was no ninth step. <laughs> You know? And, uh, and made the list and then began to make amends to people. And I had such a great power of example of my sponsor. Because my sponsor got sober in prison after he stabbed a guy to death in a bar with the knife that the bartender was cutting the lemons up with. Because the guy had called him a faggot or something like that. And he was in a blackout and stabbed the guy to death. And he got sober in prison in Attica. And uh, he had this old guy who was his sponsor. And his sponsor got out two years before him. And he met him at the prison doors the day he got out. He said, hi, Jimmy, get in the car. He said, hey, where are we going? And Monk took him over to the widow of the person he stabbed to death. Right to that house. And he said, it's time to make amends to his family. And the kids answered the door and they said, yes. And he, he started crying. He said, I'm the guy that killed your dad. Is your mom home? And they started spitting at him and stuff. And the mother came to the door. She said, what's going on? And he was just standing there, but spit going down his face, crying. He said, I'm Jimmy Gardena. I'm the man that killed your husband. And she could see how contrite he was with the spit running down his face and she told her kids you stop stop bring him inside I want to hear what he has to say and he went in he had a business that a relative had been running while he was in the joint and it was still going he had some money he told him I've taken away the person who is going to be your be your partner and help you raise your kids he told her if you need anything from me, if they need tuition for school, if they need clothes for school, if you need anything, you call me. I'm so sorry. I, there's nothing I can do. You know, and he explained what it was like for him, what happened and what it's like now. And you know, 
He walked his talk. He walked his talk. And those kids today that spit in his face call him Uncle Jim. He was the best man at one of their weddings. The guy who killed their father. You know why? Because this program works. If you work it. It doesn't do shit if you don't work it. And that's a fact. I mean, how many of you seen people that you see them every day, day in and day out, week in and week out at the meetings, and then all of a sudden you don't see them no more? Happens to me all the time. But the ones that I see working the steps are the ones that I keep seeing. So I went with Jimmy's power of example and I made my amends. And just kept going through the steps. I kept going. I learned to pray. I practiced meditating. And boy, let me tell you, for my brain to slow down enough to meditate, it's still a process I'm going through. But they said in the 12th step, you know, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice, practice these principles in all our affairs. And I have worked the steps, and so I try to practice those principles. And I try to carry a message of hope that through the steps and the traditions of this program, life can become gloriously beautiful. I mean, things still happen, painful things, hurtful things, but I don't have to let them destroy me now. I don't have to let them knock me down to where I can't say, help me God, and put my hand up and let another human being or my higher power help me back up. Because I love, I love it in the book where it says, when somebody reaches out their hand, I want the hand of AA to always be there. Because that's the way it's been. You know, when I had about 90 days, I had a little room in the YMCA where I was staying. And one night, I'm going to tell you a couple miracles that happened to me. <laughs> and they sound like they're just bullshit, but they really happen, believe it or not. I was laying in my bed in my underwear after a hard day's work and, and going to a meeting and the meeting after the meeting. And I was reading my big book and something inside of me said, go up on the roof, Dave. And I ignored it as long as I could, but it kept persistently telling me, go up on the roof, Dave. And I got dressed and I got an orange juice and I got my cigarettes and I was up on the roof in the YMCA in Brooklyn. And I'm looking across the river at the Manhattan skyline, not knowing why I'm up there. And there's this one cloud above a building and it's just lit up like there's a light within it. And I said, wow, that's neat how the light from the building is making that cloud glow. And then I'm walking around the roof and as I look back, that cloud was moving toward me. And it was now over the river, but it was still lit up. And I'm going, no, 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 no. And as it got closer to the Brooklyn side, and it was basically there and lit, and the wind was blowing so hard, my hair was standing out behind my head. And I looked down off the roof, and not a paper is blowing around in the street. And I mean, this is New York. It, papers are supposed to blow around the street. Okay. Tourists come to see that. <laughs> but I'm looking at this cloud, and the wind is blowing, and this thing says... And, inside of me it says I'm very proud of you I am with you now I've always been with you and I'll always be with you and I don't know about you man but I felt like Moses <laughs> I did and it repeated those those things to me to my heart not to my ears that it was proud of me and that had always been with me and would always be with me and was with me now. And then I'm looking at this cloud, and it started going back the other way. And as it got over the river and further and further away from me, it got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until the light just went out and the cloud just stopped on a dime. And I'm going to myself, okay, I ain't telling nobody about this. <laughs> but the next night I saw my sponsor and I told him, and he said, Dave, that was God. He says, you know, Pope's. Wait a whole lifetime for something like that. But God knew you were so screwed up that you needed something like that. And he was right. But I've held on to that through hard times. 
I've held on to that memory of that voice speaking to my heart, letting me know I wasn't alone. Now a wonderful story about the sovereign state of Texas. I had been in Texas and my car broke down in Giddings and I was there for a week. And if you've ever spent a week in Giddings, it ain't the Riviera. So I got my car finally after a week and I drove to Fort Stockton where it broke down again. Fort Stockton is home of Paisano Pete, the world's largest plexiglass road runner. And I was staying in the Tomahawk Motel all the way on the east side of town and I was flipping out. My car had broken down while I'm on this wonderful vacation twice now in a week. And so I'm fuming. I'm fuming. All of a sudden I realized I need a meeting. So I said, all right. I called up, found out where there was a meeting. They said, oh, there's a meeting a mile outside the west side of town. So I said, okay, you know, so I'll start walking. And I start walking and I'm walking and I'm walking. I didn't know the west side of town was quite so far from the east side of town. <laughs> and I'm walking some more and walking some more. And all of a sudden, here comes a big old, like, 1950s looking yellow checker cab going the other way. I'm going, hey, hey, hey. But he kept going. So I said, all right. And I kept walking. Pretty soon around the corner comes the same checkered cab and the guy makes a U-turn and he pulls up next to me. He says, where are you going? He's this old Indian guy, about probably 85 years old, he looks like. I said, I'm going going down to uh, the something center or whatever the name of it was. He says, oh, for the AA meeting? So I said, yeah. He says, get in. So I got in, and he drove me over to this place. The meeting was supposed to start at 7. We got there like quarter to 7. There was no cars there. So I said, I started thinking, well, maybe it's the wrong night or something, you know, and I'm thinking, he, the guy just says to me, don't worry, if nobody comes, I'll come back to pick you up. So I said, okay, great, what do I owe you? He said, you don't owe me nothing. And he took off in his cab. And I'm standing there alone. Finally, these cars start showing up about five minutes to, and people are running out to coffee, but hey, who the hell are you? You know? <laughs> I said, I'm Dave! <laughs> And they're like, thank you, God, because there were only like five people in the group. They'd all heard each other's story like 11,000 times. <laughs> they said, you're sharing every night until you leave. <laughs> so I chaired the meeting that night. And then when the meeting was over, I said, to, I said to this one guy, I said, hey, can I get a ride back to the Tomahawk Motel? And he said, well, yeah, I noticed you didn't have a car here. He said, How'd you get here? So I told him, well, uh, I took a cab. He said, what? I said, yeah, I took a cab. There's this big old yellow checkered cab that brought me here. The guy said, son, I live in Fort Stockton, Texas my whole life, and I have never seen a yellow checkered cab. And he drove me back, and they picked me up and brought me back and forth every night so I could chair their meeting every night. And everywhere I went in town all day long, every restaurant, any store I went in, I'd ask everybody, did you ever see a yellow checkered cab in this town? They go, no, sir. Why, did you lose one? <laughs> and that's a fact. And I don't know, I think God might have just sensed I was willing to walk 12 miles if I had to, to, to not be insane. And he sent me a ride. Anybody want to believe it? Believe it. If you don't want to believe it, you're free to go out after the meeting and say, that boy was full of shit. <laughs> but it happened to me. I was there. And you know, when I got sober there, people told me, this old jailbird John C. told me, he said, because if you keep coming back and you don't drink, your life is going to get better. Then it's going to get better than that. Then it's going to get beyond your wildest dreams. He said, things are still going to happen. And you're still going to hurt sometimes, but you never have to be alone. So I said, all right. And I have stayed sober, and I have worked the steps. And my life did get better, and better than that, and beyond my wildest dreams. Now that's not to say there weren't dips in that roller coaster ride, because there are. There's parts when I have to hang on to my ass, because I didn't make all the best decisions, even in recovery initially, you know. I would, I had this gift of looking across a crowded room and making eye contact 
with the sickest, <laughs> most insane woman who would rip my heart out and use a cheese grater on it. <laughs> And I'd think I was in a relationship, but I was just tangled up. <laughs> but you know, that's gotten so much better. It's gotten so much better because uh, I've learned to, I've learned to, like Kip was talking about last night, not need it. Not need it. And when I stopped needing it, and became comfortable in my own skin with God as my walking companion, or Fred McMurray, if you please. <laughs> then I was presented with a wonderful gift, and that's my fiance Jill. And, and we have two young girls, five and two years old, beyond my wildest dreams. I never dreamed I would be a father because I was always afraid to be the father I had. I was always afraid because that was the only father and I knew was to beat my kids and to tell them, you're so stupid, you're so ignorant, you're worthless. And I'm just so blessed today that I worked the steps in my life and practiced them on a daily basis enough to where I can be the father I always wished I had to my girls. That they don't look at me in fear and they've never seen me drunk. And they've never had to smell my ass from across the room. Because I'll wash it thoroughly today. <laughs> Did just this morning. Anybody don't believe me, come. <laughs> but to me, the connection with a higher power that I have gained from working the steps and work in the traditions in my life to the best of my ability and it doesn't even have to be 99.9% .9 anymore it can just be the best I can do that day and as long as I know it is and God knows it is I don't care what anyone else thinks it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks you know I it's doubtless that there will be people that leave this meeting and go that guy was such an asshole God bless you all. If you think I'm an asshole, that's all right. That's all right because there's somebody in this room that loves me. And it's me. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as I love me, I don't have to let myself bring my opinion of myself down because of what you think. I'm not here to win any popularity contests, certainly not any beauty contests. I'm just here to try and carry a message that if anybody is here not wanting to drink anymore but not knowing if you can stop or not, you can stop for one day, for just one day, if you're willing to try and get your spirit right with something of your understanding. And there's easy instructions. It comes in the, the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The first 164 pages of the book is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I need them both. And if you, if you got that book, don't wait for the mini-series. <laughs> Read the book. Read the book because there's freedom in there and there's beauty in there and there's lightness of spirit in there because that's where I found my higher power and that's where I found the courage to go on being me despite what I thought of myself at the time. And that's where I found the way to change the way to become somebody that walks in that sunlight of the Spirit. You know, I feel sadness very deeply today when I'm sad, but I feel joy with all my heart when I feel that. I never knew that by trying to anesthetize the pain, I was also killing all my joy, every bit of it, and just living in this gray, flatline world. And today I can live in this world 
with these people and not be afraid to be me. God don't make junk. I'm not junk and you're not junk. You're somebody special. I did nothing to earn my sobriety. I was the most dishonest and hateful and selfish person I could possibly be until that moment that I said, God, I don't have any other ideas. Please help me. And when I asked for that help, it was freely given. And so it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here to freely give it back. And I wish you all the love that you never thought you deserved. All the fellowship that you never dreamed you'd have. And a life of beautiful sobriety.